The final is in two weeks. The last official day of class, that I have class class, will be a week from today. Um, the following Monday, before, before the final, Andrea and I will be here in case you all have questions. Um, but then the next Tuesday, I'm going give to you, give you guys that off to kind of prepare for your finals. Um, but yeah, so that so a week from today, I'll show you my best trick. So is there going to be like a review on Monday? Like right, so Monday is going to be, we're going to finish up a lot, uh, chapters, chapter 11 on Monday. And then um, Tuesday and Thursday, we'll review. We'll review everything for the semester. Um, and then that'll be kind of it. Yeah. All right, good. So let's go ahead and take a look at 11.2. <laughs> Test of independence. Um, how about... Um, Ryan, read for me. A test of independence tests the null hypothesis that in a contingency table, the row and column variables are independent. Homogeneity. 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 Like, like your, like, homogenized built, same thing. Um, a proportions test is used when samples are selected from several different populations to see whether the proportions of each characteristic are the same between populations. Again, to be clear, we are not talking about cause and effect, merely association, just like correlation. Good, thank you. Definition. Um, Isla, go ahead. A contingency table or a two-way frequency table is a table in which frequencies correspond to two variables. One variable is used to categorize rows, and a second variable is used to categorize columns. Contingency tables have at least two rows and at least two columns. Yep. We've seen them before. Um, here's an example one. All right, so there's one variable, which is, either, is the outcome, success or failure. The other one is a type of treatment, where there's four rows here, and there's two columns, success column and the failure column. All right, so you can remember columns, because columns are like houses. Houses have columns that go straight up and down. All right, we're used to those. And the rows are, are these guys. Um, so this one has four rows and two columns. Everybody good with that part? Okay. This is one that you've seen before, the contingency table. So please note, Independence, test for independence, and test for homogeneity of proportions are the same thing. Because when you're, how do I know if, if two um, variables are independent? It's when their proportions are homogeneous, the same. Homogeneous is the same, right? So homogeneity of proportions means when the proportions are the same. So having the same proportions means you're independent. They're the same test. In this case, um, how do, how can we tell if male and chocolate were independent? How, do you folks remember how we, how we, how we tested that? Yeah. Chocolate males, and I took the total of chocolates, the total of males, and my grand total. Right, everyone remember that part? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I checked to see if five over eight is equal to 25 over 40. Is it? Yeah. Yes. So then they're independent because their proportions are the same. Mm -hmm. Right? So when, when the proportions are the same, that's when they are independent. Right? This portion. Who was that? Since it's going to be independent, that means equal sort of thing for the H naught? Yes, exactly. Independence means H um, naught. Um, so here, for all for the proportions to be homogeneous, that means that all the proportions must be equal. So it means that this proportion, that proportion, that proportion, that proportion, all have to be the same. Um, because now we're looking at gender, like both male and female, and and the type of lab. <coughs> so everybody find these proportions: five over eight. 15 over 25, 10 over 16. Find them all. Let's set your calculator. Find them. Find them. Angela, calculator. Find. Them. 
What's the first one? Five or eight, if you had Michaela, what'd you get for the first one? Michaela. Um Angelina, what'd you get for the for the next one? Uh Scott, what'd you get for the next one? Ari, what did you get for the last one? 0.625. Right, so all of them are equal. These are independent. Now bear in mind that if I took a coin, what's probably of getting heads? 50. 50%. But if I flip a coin 100 times, I might not get exactly 50. I might get 48, 49, you know, do you know what I mean? Somewhere. So just bear in mind, they're not, they're, they may not match exactly. They might be off a little bit, but they should be off by a lot. So that's kind of what we're testing to see if they're off by a reasonable amount, as opposed to they're off so much that, that these proportions cannot be the same. Okay, here's some notation. Um, Newer, go ahead and read for me. All represents the observed frequency in the cell of a contingency table. E represents the expected frequency in a cell formed by assuming that the row and column variables are independent. R represents the number of rows in a contingency table, not including labels or totals. C represents the number of columns in a contingency table, not including labels or totals. Right, so do not include the labels or the totals in your, you know, when you, when you figure out the rows and columns. Good, thank you. So, test for independent or homogeneity, homogeneity proportions. The chi-squared test can be used to test the independence of these. The hypotheses are H1. Lindsay, what's my H1 options? Uh, there's a relationship between two variables. Wait, what did you say? Wait, what are you asking? H0? <laughs> wait, what? H0. Can we read that one? Yeah. Oh, I heard H1, sorry. There's a relationship between two variables. Homogeneity proportions, P1 equals P2 equals P3 equals P4. Generic O sub I equals B sub I. Right, so again, H now is always no. No difference, no relationship, which also means that they're equal. P1 equals P2 equals P3 equals P4, however many proportions you have. Or generically, O sub I equals E sub I. H1, um, Alondra, oh, yeah, go ahead and read that one for me. E of I, e sub I, yeah. So depending on what you pick, you can use any one of those for your H naught, and depending on which one you pick for your H naught, you should pick the matching one for your H1. Right? If there's no relationship for an H naught, then H1 would be there is a relationship. If H naught says that the portions are all equal, then H1 would say that at least one differs. Okay. I don't care which one you use, I'm fine with any of them. Just, you know, be aware that your homework may want a specific one, possibly. Okay. So in order to test the null hypothesis, we have to compute the expected frequencies, um, assuming that, that the null hypothesis is true. So we're going to compute the expected frequencies. Um, when data are arranged in table form for the independence test, it's called a contingency, contingency table. Our degrees of freedom is rows minus one multiplied by columns of minus one. So you have to figure out, count how many rows you have, count how many columns you have, and then subtract one from each and multiply them. So we'll go over one of those in just a minute. And again, the formula for your test set is exactly the same as this for 11.1. Take every observed minus the expected squared, divide by the expected, and then add them all up. There is one difference though we also have this thing called the expected frequency. So the expected frequency is a little bit harder to find. Remember, you always have to compute them. And before, we would just take the total number of to n and multiply by the proportion, you know, the, the probability for that, for that group. This is a little bit harder. 
take the rho sum, multiply by the column sum, and divide by the grand total. So we'll go over one of those as well. All right. Um, and we're going to, so since you have, um, so let's talk about this for a second. Okay, so the expected values are sort of the, the work you have to do for this, for 11.2, a little bit more. I don't want you to find all of them. First semester I taught this class, I went, they, all my students had to find all of them for, the, for all the possible for the whole matrix. I expect you to show me how to, you know how to find it though, by showing me on the first one and the last one. Um, and you'll see what I mean by matrix in just a minute. Because in 11.1, .1, you, you're writing out whatever your O sub I, your, what was it, 20, you know, 28 minus 33.3 squared divided by 33.3 .3 plus blah, blah, blah. Since you showed me that in 11.1, .1, you do not need to show it again in 11.2. But you do need to show me you understand how to find the expected frequencies and again, not all of them, just the first one and the last one. And you might say, well, why are we going to bother with that? Because you should understand that theoretically you'd find all of them, all nine of them, or all six of them, or all eight of them, and then do observed minus expected squared divided by expected. But, but since I'm going to kind of let you off the hook and let you just use the calculator to compute these, then at least you have to show me you still understand the fundamentals of how to find this part. Okay. So on the computer, or the calculator, excuse me, um, we're going to use stat test chi-square test. There are, it'll, it'll show up like this, it'll say observed, A, with a little square bracket around it, that means matrix A. And that says expected, B, with a little matrix around it, little, little square brackets around it. What that means is, you take your data, and you input it into matrix A. And that's what it's going to look for. Matrix B, I'm going to look up. Everybody look up. Matrix B, you do not have to put anything into matrix B. You're telling the program, the calculator, find the expected values, and you store them into matrix B for me. So the calculator will compute all the expected values, and it will store them into matrix B. You do not put anything into matrix B. You just put your stuff into matrix A. Um, this will make a lot more sense when we go through it, but I kind of wanted to give you the heads up on that. All right, let's do, a, um, let's do an example together. So here is hospitals and infections. First off, everybody make little marks around this mark around what the, where the matrix is. Figure out where the matrix is. Figure out how many rows and columns we have. Figure out where those go. Is it this? Is that my matrix there? No. No, I'm leaving stuff out. Everybody see that? So figure out where the matrix marks should go and put them in. This is an example on the next page. How many columns do I have? Three. 
So in the matrix should be three by three, three rows and three columns. Did you draw yours? Three rows and three columns. Where's your data? Thank you.